This is a revision video for electrolysis in water and molten electrolytes from the C6 topic by Mr. Klee. A lot of people struggle with the concept of electrolysis, but it's a fairly straightforward one. Um, essentially, if a liquid can have electricity pass through it, then it can be decomposed by having electricity pass through it, which literally means it's broken down into two or more different things. Um, the liquid that we pass the current through is always called the electrolyte. And in order for an electrolyte to conduct electricity and to be able to broken down by electrolysis, it must contain ions that are free to move. Um, these ions can be positive ions, in, this, in which case they're called cations, and they can be negative ions in which case they're called anions. A common examination question refers to why, um, why solid ionic compounds cannot conduct electricity um, and why molten and dissolved ionic compounds can. And it's basically because of, that the ions are fixed in place in a, um, in a solid compound. What you have here is you have positive and negative ions arranged in a giant ionic lattice which means that uh, the opposite charges of the positive and negative are tightly bound together it requires a lot of energy to break that apart and therefore they cannot move but if you if you melt that electrolyte or dissolve it in water then the ions become free to move and then it will conduct electricity because it then conducts electricity, you can use that electricity to break it down into its constituent parts. This device is a Hoffman's voltameter. This is what's used to break down water. Uh, when you break down water, you essentially go from H2O, a very simple level, to hydrogen and oxygen. When that happens, the hydrogen, because it is a cation, is formed at the cathode or the negative electrode and the oxygen, because it is an anion, is formed at the anode or the positive electrode. As previously stated, the, uh, the cations are the positive ones, they're the ones that move towards the cathode. The cathode is negative and the positive ions are the cations. This is because opposites attract. It's very difficult to, to think of a way to remember this. Um, the Alex Watts method is, is one that's often employed, although it's not a viewpoint I necessarily subscribe to. Um, using the beginning of the word, cath, Alex subscribes to the viewpoints that Catholics are negative, therefore the cathode is negative. Because the cathode is negative, cations must be positive, and the opposite there must therefore be true. The anode is positive and the anions are negative. The diagrams that you get given for electrolysis vary, but they're essentially the same. You have an anode, which is positive in each case, and it is always positive, but it's not always on the right and it's not always on the left. You have cathode, which is negative, which in the case of the molten electrolysis is the whole base of the container. And you have something providing electricity. There's a battery in that case, a cell here, and mains electricity in this one. There is always an electrolyte, molten aluminium oxide, molten sodium chloride, or the electrolyte solution in this more generic diagram. And there is always a current flowing between them. Because there is a current flowing between them, what you end up with is the production of anions at the anode, cations at the cathode, as shown here, and the product of that reaction. So in this case, you've got chlorine gas made at the anode. In this case, you've got molten aluminium. The iron for aluminium is Al3+. Because it is Al3+, it is formed at the cathode. And in this case, we have generic positive cations and generic negative anions. 
Moving back to the electrolysis of water, the two ions contained in water are hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Um, the equation for the hydrogen, the half equation for the formation of hydrogen at the cathode is fairly straightforward, whereas the half equation for the formation of oxygen at the anode is a little bit more complicated. So here we have the equation for um, the formation of hydrogen at the cathode. I'm sorry, but the subscript and superscript numbers have not come through very well. Essentially, what you have is two hydrogen ions which react with two electrons at the cathode forming hydrogen gas. Um, the key things to remember when doing half equations is that you must always make sure that these signs here are the same. They are always the same in this half equation. Positive ions must gain electrons, negative ions must lose electrons. Another thing to be aware of is that if you have a diatomic molecule, then in a diatomic molecule you're going to require two of the ions. A little trick that I sometimes employ when trying to do this is a little cross multiplication. Whatever this number is, times by this number is, gives you this number. Um, it's a little bit more tricky when you go onto the hydroxide ions at the anode, but it works for most other simple half equations. So this is the equation for what happens at the anode. The reason that this is more complicated is that you start with hydroxide ions. These hydroxide ions form oxygen gas and water. The first thing that you need to do when writing out this equation is make the number of oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms on the right hand side in the products equal to each other. And in this case there are four of each. The two oxygens here and the other two there and four hydrogens in total here. Once that's equal you can treat it the same as you did before in the sense of you add in four for the hydroxide ions, you do cross multiplication with the invisible with the number here and the number there to give you the number of electrons. Make sure that your signs are the same in the middle and that should give you the balanced simple equation. Four hydroxide ions take away four electrons gives you your oxygen gas which is the one that you're concerned about and the leftover water not forgetting to put the two in. The principles in molten electrolysis are exactly the same. Um, the ions can move because they have been melted and therefore can conduct electricity and be decomposed by electricity. The principles of the half equation are exactly the same. You need to identify the ion and the product. You need to identify are you adding or taking away electrons? How many of those electrons you need in order to balance it? In this example here, at the anode, because it is an anion, negative anion, you have two oxygen ions, each with a charge of minus two. So in order to balance that, those two with minus two, you need four electrons. They are both subtracted because those signs must be the same, giving you one molecule of oxygen gas, diatomic oxygen gas. Same principles apply in any molten electrolyte. Uh, lead bromide, PBBr2, contains lead 2 plus ions and bromine um, ions as well. I would like you to try and write half equations for, what, for what's going on at the cathode. Remembering at the cathode you have positive ions because it's negative and the anode remembering that it's negative ions because it's positive. Remember, two, with half equations, you are always writing two equations for a full process. There are two more examples that you can try on this page. You have lead iodide containing lead 2 plus ions and iodine ions. Again, focus on what's happening at the cathode 
and the anode and the example of sodium chloride containing sodium ions and chlorine ions not forgetting what happens at the cathode and the anode remember that you need to be aware of diatomic molecules when doing these um, if you want me to check your answers when you've gone through them I'm quite happy for you to bring them to me and show them or you can show them to your, your teacher and they'll be able to help you with any of these uh, thank you very much for watching that was the C6 revision video on electrolysis of molten compounds and of water.